Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We're so grateful that you are here with us today because we know that God is going to meet you in this time. We'd love the opportunity to connect with you. So if you would take a moment and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will be on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and worshiping with us and also let us know how we can be in prayer for you. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join with me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Merciful God, search us and know us. In this season of Lent, grant us courage to take honest stock of ourselves and acknowledge our wrongdoings. Jesus, as we walk with you towards the cross, take away our bent to sinning and teach us how to live. In Jesus' name, amen. As a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name. Not to preach our creeds or customs, but to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nation, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we are givers, we are vessels made of clay. By our gentle, loving actions, we would show that Christ is life. In an humble, listening spirit, we would live to God's delight. As a green bud in the springtime is a sign of life renewed, so may we be signs of oneness in earth's people's many hue. As a rainbow lights the heavens when a storm is past and gone, may our lives reflect the radiance of God's new and glorious dawn. Hello, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of your associate pastors at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I have the great honor and privilege of leading us in our congregational prayer today. So I invite you to enter into an attitude of prayer. As I'm praying, I will pause during the prayer at the point where you can lift up the names of persons that you want to remember in prayer by simply speaking their names with your voice or in your heart. Let us pray. Almighty God, be with us as we contend with our lives and all our challenges. Thank you for listening as we bring before you the troubles that undermine us. Lord, rescue us when we stumble. Strengthen and sustain our families and our communities, we pray. Nurture the bonds between us and inspire us to live with empathy and compassion and forgiveness. 
Help those struggling with work or facing uncertainty in their futures that they may find peace in your abundant love. Be with our leaders and, and those around the world that they may act with compassion and generosity. Guide them to humbly serve their own countries and to foster peace across our borders. God, our Creator, inspire us with renewed hope. Deepen our faith to hear Your Word and follow Your way. Encourage us to bring all our hopes and desires to You in prayer, that in lifting up our hearts to You, we may be shaped by Your love. Comfort those battling ill health to bear their pain with patience, strength, and courage. We especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and sustain us in our times of trial. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. And as Jesus taught His disciples to pray, so now we also pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in our worship, I invite you to enter into a time of reflection uh, about our giving and the way that we worship God through our giving. You can worship God by giving offerings at a live worship service or by mailing checks to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. You can also give through our church website. So now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over because I've got something to share with them. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David and I'm going to be leading the children's sermon today. Now I have a question for you. Does anybody know what a boomerang is? A boomerang. Okay, yeah, yeah, several, several know. Okay, good. Yeah, boomerang is like a curved stick from Australia and you throw it and it goes around and it comes back to you, it comes right back to your hand. Boomerangs have been used by the aboriginal peoples in Australia for thousands of years. Now, in our day and age, of course, everything's computerized. And I came across something I thought would make a great children's sermon. And that is this a uh, little sphere, I'll call it, with the flashing lights. And I watched a video online and heard this thing described. And I thought, what a great children's message because you throw it out and it comes right back to you. And I thought, well, I'll talk about how, you know, if we ever stray away from God, we can always come back to God, right? Okay, well, let's, uh, let me just demonstrate here and pay attention. This is very, very important. Okay, we got it cranked up. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out. Oh, oh, hang on, I'll be right back. Wait, I'm coming back. Wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop. Uh, I almost. <sighs> I got it. I got it. 
I paid $10 for this. And all I do is chase it around. So what do you think? <laughs> well, let me catch my breath. I'll tell you what I think. In life, sometimes things just don't work out. You know what I mean? Like if you're in school and you have a test and you study for it, you go to school to take your test, you look at the test, there's nothing on there that you recognize. You think, I must have studied the wrong things. And you studied so hard, but it just didn't work out. Or you're planning uh, maybe an outdoor birthday party. It pours down rain and you have to cancel or reschedule. Or maybe you're going on vacation. And what happens? Somebody gets sick in your family and you have to cancel the vacation. There's all kinds of ways in life that things just don't work out like we had planned for them to do or like we wanted them to do. But one thing's for certain, God never changes. God is always there for us. Anytime we want to go back to God and turn back to God, God is always ready to love us and to welcome us back. Let's pray together. Lord God, in our lives, when things don't work out, um, sometimes we're disappointed, sometimes we, we have to just go with the flow, sometimes we just have to make the best of it. But we're thankful, Lord, that one thing we can always count on is You. You are always right where you're supposed to be. You're always ready and willing to welcome us back to You. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for the children and youth of our church and community. And bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great privilege to deliver the gospel message today. As we welcome the new year, we have taken a moment to ponder the beautiful reasons and purpose behind God's creation. And now, as we are at the beginning of the season of land, it is time to reflect on our brokenness and vulnerability. Our journey begins with the narrative of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. So hear the word of God from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 and 21. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, 
I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife, and clothed them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Speak through me and always be on me so that your word might be heard by your people this day through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My mother has been dedicated to the church life alongside my father, who serves as a pastor at the Korean Methodist Church. One of her many roles was caring for the children on Sunday. Since there was not a nursery care team at my father's church, whenever young adult parents came to worship service with their young children, my mom always took care of them during the worship service so that their parents could focus on the worship service. And naturally, I also ended up taking care of them and playing with them. And along the way, I realized something. The moment when I felt most worried and fearful while being with the children or kids were not the moment when they were running around, nor the moment when they were making loud noise or throwing toys or crying loudly. It was the moment when silence filled the space, when I realized it was too quiet in that moment. I couldn't help but wonder why is it so quiet? Why this silence? It was the moment I sensed something was wrong and something's happened. And then I started desperately looking for the kids and shouting, where are you? Where are you? Well, let me tell you this story. When I was about one or two years old, just starting to speak with basic words and sentences, According to my parents, I was already quite talkative. They said I would babble all day long, even though I couldn't form complete sentence yet. And then one day, my mom noticed that the personage was unusually quiet. And immediately she thought, oh, something's wrong. And she said, where are you, Unsu? Where are you? The place where my mom found me was right in the kitchen. Little two-year-old Eunsu had somehow found a bottle of olive oil and poured it all over the floor, enjoying the slippery sensation and showering with oil by herself and rubbing kitchen shelves with that oil. Yeah, I will not go into how my mom had to clean that up. Well, when the parents call out, where are you to find their children? Or when we call out to find our loved one, the feeling behind it might be worry or anger. Your children didn't do their homework or curiosity or perhaps we already know where they are and are just asking. But I think one thing is sure, the underlying sentiment is common. It is, hey, I want to see you. Hey, where are you? I wish you were here with me. 
I want you to be present with me. So today, through the words given to us, we will experience God who seeks people with this heart to say, where are you? The book of Genesis begins with the glory of creation. This is what we have been exploring in chapters 1 and 2 in this new year under the sermon series, Who Am I? As God orchestrates the unfolding of a creation, God pauses repeatedly to look at his handiwork and summarize them with a single description, which is, it is very good. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 says, God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. This affirmation is not a one-time thing. It is repeated seven times throughout the only chapter 1. The goodness and greatness of creation are magnified by the fact that it is not human, but the perfect creator himself who is declaring to be very good. While we, as humans, naturally take pleasure in creation, God's delight demonstrates just how extraordinary creation truly is. Until this point, we have been listening to God's perfect design and the perfect conditions of the Garden of Eden. But then, when we come to Genesis chapter 3. In this chapter 3, which is today's scripture passage, this glorious creation is suddenly and tragically wrecked. The serpent's plan succeed. First Eve, then Adam, it's the fruit of the forbidden tree. They cross the lines God set for them trying in vain to be like God in their ways. They already experience the goodness of God's creation, but they choose to become wise in their own ways. In other words, their choice missed the marks, missed the purpose of what God designed. Due to their decision, they break the relationship with God and break the relationship with themselves. They no longer talk with God in the evening, evening breeze, but hide themselves from the God's presence. And Adam blamed Eve for his decision to eat the fruit and get in a dig at God at the same time. In verse 12, he said, the woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me this fruit from the tree, so I ate. And likewise, Eve breaks humanity's relationship with the creatures of the earth by blaming the serpent for her own decision. Their decisions trigger the situation where the good creation is now ruined and twisted. God's perfect creation is now damaged. Making decisions according to my will rather than God's will. Prioritizing my voices over God's voice. Avoiding admitting wrongdoing. And all contribute to failing our relationship with God and with others. If all of this seem entirely familiar, and if they resemble a story you have seen or experienced at some point in your life, then it is not just your imagination. In fact, we live in such a broken world because we have been born after that fall and have only known the fallen world and distorted or this humankind. When we read this passage, it is easy to focus on God's judgment in the passage. And this focus makes us to feel uncomfortable, ashamed, upset, 
and even angry to encounter our brokenness. When we realize our brokenness and vulnerability, it is really hard to stare straight ahead ourselves and raise our head toward the cross and this shame and fear block the way for us to come before God. And this is exactly what Adam and Eve felt. And this is exactly why Adam and Eve hid. And this is exactly why Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. But here is something we miss now. God's grace before the judgment. Let's go to the verses 7 and 8. In verse 7, after eating the forbidden fruit, they knew that they were naked and they were ashamed, so that they covered themselves by fig leaves. Then we would expect verse 8 to say that God immediately came down and struck Adam and Eve because they had sinned against God. But God graciously did nothing. There was not an immediate judgment. Instead, verse 8 says, God was walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Well, this is probably their life routine. God would come to the garden and walk with Adam and Eve. They could interact with God and enjoy being with Him. And God is doing as usual instead of immediate judgment. God is graciously waiting. This is the first grace God shows. God is graciously waiting. But Adam and Eve were not there. They heard God coming and they just panicked because they knew they deserved death. They disobeyed the command from God and they knew the punishment for that. So they were scared and they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. This scene is sad and comic because we know that God knew where they were. It must have felt like playing hide and seek with your children. They are hiding behind something that is too small to cover them, and you can see them the whole time. That is how it would have looked to God. Even the lift clothing that Adam and Eve had made and the strong trees in the garden could not hide them from God. And here, when God knows they are not ready to walk with Him, we experience God's grace once again in the question. God calls out to them, where are you? Three simple words, where are you, mean so much. God is not searching for them. God knows exactly where they are now, God gives them a chance to show themselves, to be present with God. God wants to recover their relationship. God is looking for a fellowship with one creature capable of true fellowship, and that creature is hiding from Him. And so God's question is a cry, a broken disfellowship and broken love. Where are you? I, I know everything. Where are you? Just, just come here. Just let us restore our broken relationship. This is the second grace God shows. God is graciously calling out. Where are you? But still, they don't notice God's grace. So Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He doesn't say, Lord, I am here. Finally, God shows overwhelming grace. Verse 21 says, Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. This is more than an act of clothing. 
It was an act that was both practical and symbolic. It shows God's practical concern for human and their condition. God does not leave Adam and Eve naked in the earth. Above all, fig leaves couldn't protect their skin. It is irritating to human skin. I googled, fig le I googled fig leaves texture and it said, the top of the leaf is rough and sandpaper-like, while the bottom of the leaf has small and stiff hairs. So what they covered their shame with fig leaves was covering their brokenness with punishing leaves. But God provides the soft garment for them. This act is all symbolic. The garment of skin that God made for Adam and Eve and placed upon them to cover their shame required the shedding of blood. In other words, this animal skin garment needed the sacrifice of animals to cover humans' shame, which is result of broken communion and God covers their shame to restore broken communion. And it reminds of the salvation we have been given in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for us to restore our broken relationship with God. This is overwhelming grace. God is covering our shame brokenness, vulnerability with a garment of salvation through Jesus Christ's blood. So friends, the end of Genesis chapter 3 is the beginning of salvation story. Now we are embarking on the journey of land, a sacred time to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. We remember his blood shed for us and his body broken for us. And this is overwhelming grace and unconditional love that we don't deserve. God has been continuously extending his grace to us from the beginning until now, waiting for us, calling us, and covering our shame. And there is only one thing we need to when God is calling out you, where are you? Do not hide, but respond with, Lord, I am here. So I want to invite you to join in this action plan. During land, each pastor will offer specific actions based on their sermons. And this week, every morning when you get up, stand before the mirror and look at yourself and open your hands and pray. Lord, I am here. I bring my brokenness, my vulnerability. Shower with your grace and love and clothe me with the garment of salvation. In the name of Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you for your amazing love and overwhelming grace. Help us encounter our brokenness and vulnerability. Cover our shame with your garment of blood. Give us your strength and courage to walk this journey towards the cross in this season of the land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beloved Riceville, God is waiting for you. God is asking, where are you? God is covering your brokenness and vulnerability. So do not hide and respond with, Lord, I am here. May our God of love and peace, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go with you and stay with you this day and forevermore. Amen.